All right, hi world. Welcome back to a, another video, and I'm happy to be back. Good as new, and hopefully y'all can hear me pretty good. I was thinking about playing some music right now. I'm kind of tempted to play some some of that good sweet lo-fi. I think we could have some fun doing that. You know what? I am gonna go ahead and do it. Uh, first, let me create a new tab. Too many tabs open. Let me go on YouTube. And then, yeah, I'm going to, um, yeah, let's play some of this cool Starfield stuff. Uh, I'm going to put on my headphones before I do that so I can listen along. But as the video suggests, I am here doing yet another Let's Play tutorial, continuing the campaign that we've pretty much left off last time. Except this time, we're now in the winter, winter of 1941. And so, situation is a little different. A little different than what uh, what we've had in the summer period. Pretty much the same armies, though. And so, pretty excited. Uh, let me see if I uh, just make sure the audio settings are good. Give it another second here. Nope. We'll do that. Okay. So the music music will start in a moment. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and wait. And be patient. Yeah, there we go. Nice. So I just love the science fiction uh, concept art. I've always been a big always been a big sci-fi fan and the, I think the reason is pretty obvious if you ask me why sci-fi is so cool I mean I think for one it's cool because the technology is like an upgrade of what we have currently number one number two you know um, it's a lot of work to get to the, that sort of science fiction you know it's gonna be a lot of work for sure um, so I did study engineering I went to undergraduate school, I'm sure everybody wants to know, but man, let me tell you, when I found myself really just disengaged with uh, science in college, I'm the first to say it, you know, I, I pretty much forced myself too much, I guess, to be a scientist. I really wanted to be one though, and I was able to graduate just barely through the skin of my teeth uh, with pretty much a C GPA. Um, but oh, it was so stressful. I had to retake so many courses. It took me so many years to get the undergraduate degree. By the time I was done, I was out of there. I mean, I was, I mean, I was, I wasn't even relieved. I was just glad the stress was over. So that's my story uh, as far as uh, trying to do something more productive than playing war games, right? Um, but that's not why y'all are here. Y'all are here to enjoy some war games with me, where we uh, seem to know a lot of interesting facts about this game, all the game mechanics. Um, not sure how it's going to help, I guess, the world or the economy or anything like that, but I can certainly say that um, it is definitely a comfort zone for me, and it comes to me very naturally. So with that, uh, talk about Path of Least Resistance. Um, that's what I'm trying to adapt more in my life, my lifestyle. It seems to be working pretty good. Um, just trusting the process is really important. You know, having faith, dare I say. Um, but trusting the process is, the, I think, the best way to put it for the modern thinker. And uh, definitely helps. Definitely helps um, because there's actually more going on in this cerebral cortex and hippocampus and all the other parts of the brain, there's more going on there than, than we actually know. And then you or I, huh? see what I did there? I said you, you, and I. You see where I'm going with that, right? So, you know, and there's just way more going on than what meets the, huh? You know where I'm going with that, right? So, so anyways, uh, there's, more, there's more to learn and all that good stuff. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. There's always a place uh, science is dear near to my heart, even if it's repulsed by my my thoughts, mostly. 
I guess, or my spirit. I don't know. I don't want to say that, but my spirit shuddered during my years in college. It was so painful, and it shouldn't have shouldn't have needed to be that painful. I mean, for goodness sakes, I've fractured a, a wrist here, right? With this, that was painful. Okay, um, that was really painful, and yet all the emotion of pain. It's just like. That's a that was that was really extra for some reason. Why? Well, why you gotta be so dang extra all the time? And 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 I know why. Eyes knows why. You see. So that's what I'm learning is is that kind of thing. And um, you know, chicken wing thing. You know, you know, thing thing, potato potato. So that said, let's uh, jump into our winter campaign. And we're gonna go ahead and um, yeah, have some fun. So uh, we're gonna end the log file for November. And now we're gonna start the file for December. And we're just gonna push on through. I'll tell you now, I'll be frank and just say that uh, for some reason, the winter campaign is just so much more of a slog than the uh, summer campaign. And, and the frank, I think the, the reality is that this entire game is a complete slog except for a few cool operations here and there. So you guys got to witness uh, me do Operation Barbarossa. That's as fast moving as this game is probably gonna get. I'm gonna be frank with you because a lot of the battles are just a slugfest. So it, it really does come, to, come down to the dice rolls. That's what I'm trying to say here. It's gonna come down to the dice rolls and the dice rolls are really where a lot of the magic or probability rather happen in this game so um you know the allies the allies definitely gain an advantage they definitely gain an advantage in world war ii against the axis but it doesn't happen overnight and you know as we learn in this conflict you know you end up with just all this attritional battles that take place and a lot of it i think probably does stem a little bit from the doctrines that the allied nations were implementing um, but I think a lot of it also, a lot of, I think a lot of credit, credit does have to be given to the Wehrmacht forces. No, they weren't the best forces of World War II necessarily. And, and that's kind of a subjective claim anyways. But, you know, there is a sort of stereotypical reputation that the Wehrmacht had for having very strong um, offense and defense, both. And I think there is a lot of truth in that, but maybe some of those cases are a bit exaggerated. Um, or at least we hear a lot of that from the bias of, I believe, the a lot of the German um, war memoirs. And keep in mind that most of the Germans that the Western powers, the Western world, basically either interviewed or interrogated or whatever they did following World War II, they were doing this in the wake of the Cold War. So any any of the Wehrmacht soldiers that weren't under the Western Allied power captivity were under the Soviet power captivity and the Soviets had their own sort of agenda as far as gaining intelligence about the enemy and also preparing for war. So uh, for the Cold War. And so basically, you know, a lot of our sources are a little biased. They, they've kind of been biased, although think, thanks to at least the work of David Glantz. And, and by the way, David Glantz is really the only historian I've really read. But I do have his uh, When Titans Clash book. I have it here. I guess I can show you past. Here you go. So this officially makes me a military historian, okay? I got a history book. And I did read through it. And um, it was actually a really nice summary of the Eastern Front. I think the area that helped the most was uh, really the soviet operations I, I really find that the soviet operations are usually overlooked um and and frankly the soviet union the soviet army the red army i think it's one of the most bizarre armies of world war ii i probably say it's the most bizarre one probably the only one i would argue is probably more odd is perhaps the japanese army um or the japanese navy one of the two but i would argue still per personally i would say that the soviets are still even that much more bizarre because when you have this odd bunch up of T-26 tanks with KV-1 tanks, old and new aircraft, old and new artillery, lots of manpower, yet there were still a lot of uh, units that were under-equipped. 
So you've, you've got this like sort of distribution problem, I think, for the Soviet army. And, you, and this is not really depicted that much in the, in the game here since we're at such a strategic level. But I do think that the game does a great job of just showing you the, the diversity of Soviet units. And so we have um, all these being armies or corps, but you have the standard infantry armies. Then you have these guard armies, which technically are these titles aren't awarded until like 1943. So they're not going to be guard armies for now, but you have that option. Just to label them as guard units. You have these uh, armored corps. We have uh, some mech corps. We have cavalry corps. We have shock army corps, or shock armies rather. You know, here the, here's a mech corps. Um, we eventually also are going to get some Soviet reinforcements. These uh, four combat valued uh, tank units, and these are actual tank armies. So they're at full strength and they're just as strong as any German Panzer Corps. And the Soviets get a handful of these later on. So it's going to take time to build them up to full strength, but we, we, we do eventually gain the firepower that gives the Soviets just a cutting edge on the battlefield. Plus Soviet air power starts to get double fire and eventually triple fire. So I would argue the Soviets are in this, even in this game, just super interesting in the, in the diversity of units, but overall very bizarre army. So I, I would love to spend more time studying that. Um, but I, I wish I could tell you it's a uh, easy subject to study, but it really is a dense read. A lot of data and you know you gotta get ready just to read up on a lot of random towns in eastern europe plus you're um, reading up on somewhat repetitive battles i would say the one drag of world war ii and and i guess for this game too um is is the fact that a lot of the operations are a bit of a drag you know they after a while they're kind of just rinse and repeat in my opinion and and that seems to be a big case for the eastern front especially when when the soviets finally gain the initiative um, and, you know, in hindsight, we kind of know how the war ends. So I don't know, maybe after the Battle of Kursk, you know, um, you kind of end up with that drag of fighting. But, but the truth is, if you pay a little bit closer attention, I would actually say the Soviet operations in the latter half of the war, there's some pretty interesting tactical feats that the Soviets did that, um, that actually are some pretty interesting stories. And not to mention the way they organized their large operations were intrinsically very different than the way the Germans did. Um, the Soviets had like rocket artillery in greater numbers, more tanks, more artillery. Um, and they were fighting against a very deadly foe. They were fighting against the, you know, the Wehrmacht that had the very good anti-tank guns. And I guess, I guess the very famous uh, heavy German tanks, but they were few in number. But the point I'm trying to make is that they were fighting against a very competent army. And, and when you look at the casualties, I think the, stat, the stats do speak a lot. Um, the Soviet army did sustain, continue to sustain some pretty high losses, but the German losses began to, to mount up pretty high as well. So anyways, I think I've talked long enough. Um, I'm actually going to end this log file. I'm going to start again, but this time I'm going to call it 12-00 for the production. And so we're going to update the production. We're going to go to the player A table. And what I'm going to do is just look at the Eurofront basic production table. We go to winter 41 and you can see that some of the production is, is boosted. In fact, all three rows are boosted. The axes are going to gain 25 production or excuse me. They, they're going to gain five from negative 30 to negative 25. I'm not sure why they're negative, but they are, they start negative. Um, but Axes are going to gain 5 production, the Allies in the West are going to gain 10 production, the Soviets are gaining 6 production. So we'll start with the Soviets, and we're just going to add on from 40, what is it, 44, now to 50. And I believe that's the math right, according to my calculations, the, the Soviets have lost 24 production. If I do the math right, I mean, six is Leningrad. I always like to count this six for Leningrad, seven, eight, let's see, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Count 19. Oh, plus, plus five in Murmansk. Yeah, that's 24. That's a lot of loss in, in Soviet production. So we're at 50 production for the Soviets. We do have a few more shock armies to reinforce, but frankly, I'm not gonna use too many of them. I think my main focus for this turn is gonna be um, to 
Um, not be too aggressive with my offensive operations just yet, even though, I mean, I could. Truth is, most of my Soviet units are just under strength, um, especially after the recent Battle of Smolensk. So what I want to do instead is I'm just going to try to focus on building up, you know, all the rear guard units as best I can. And that's really what I'm going to focus my production on for this turn. You know, any, any units, just try to build them up a little bit. They don't all have to be at full strength, but... I would like to have a few at full strength. So right now I've built three. And then I'm gonna build like these two guys up. So that's already five units that I've built up. That's 10 production points. But I'm gonna build up Stavka. That's already 20. Western HQ, that's gonna be 30. I think that's it for um, crown units. Yeah. Unless I want to try to do some sort of attack, I mean, I can, I just don't know where. We really don't have much in in the form of reserves. I could try to stack up like a lot of shock armies here and try to push them out of uh, Smolensk. I'm gonna, I kind of want to wait on that, frankly. But anyways, I've, I've done 30 production. I'm left with 20 for now. And this is where things start to get a little tight as far as building up new units. And uh, I just got to figure out what the best strategy is. Uh, let's build up Sevastopol. So now we have 18 left. I can build up uh, this mech units or cavalry units. That's going to reduce me down to 15. I think I want to build up maybe this uh, other cavalry unit over here. Going to bring me down to 12. And then with that 12, I mean, all I have left is really just trying to build um, other other units, you know, other ground units. I kind of want to make an attack over here as well. Try to make an attack on the north. Try to keep the keep the Germans busy. I think that's the main theme, is to really focus on keeping the German army as busy as we can. So we have twelve. Without without um exhausting our own like strategic reserve, right? That's the big challenge. I'm pretty sure. Is trying to make a move without exhausting our reserve. I think the main problem I'm seeing is that we don't have enough HQs. We really don't. So I'm gonna build up this uh, Ukrainian HQ over here. But I, I really, what I really wanted to do is build up all these like lost Soviet units because we're just low on troops. But I don't even know how soon I'll be able to send these units to the front. I think I'm actually, hmm. so it is kind of a weird spot as far as uh, trying to figure out how to how to do it. Maybe I got to pass up on Stavka. Maybe I got to pass up on, on uh, using Stavka this turn. Maybe that's what I'll do. I think I have two more left, right? I think these two I'm gonna put over here. I can do that. And yeah, I guess I guess this is what we're gonna do. That's the, the general idea is to simply try to uh, get as many units as we can uh, moving up to the front. Try to get a strong reserve set up somehow. I think I may even set this uh, another shock unit in Orel, and then that's all. For, that's all we're gonna do for reinforcements. I mean. I don't really need much reinforcements elsewhere. The rest of the front seems pretty safe, if you ask me. Relatively safe against German attacks. And that's really all I'm really worried about right now, as the uh, as the Soviets, is uh, German attacks. Um, of course, I would love to move up more HQ units, but I think we're going to have to wait another turn. And not to mention, man, there's also the idea of focusing on Leningrad. I totally forgot about Leningrad on this turn, didn't I? Maybe I'll actually activate this HQ or this army, try to set it over there perhaps. Probably be the better option, frankly. But I think what's also clear is that I want to have H some sort of Stavka HQ in position to get these units deployed. I 
Like I, I definitely don't want to dilly dally on on a northern operation. I'd rather attack as soon as possible, really. But we probably will need another turn anyways, just to activate our HQ. So yeah, I think I'm going to make the decision of. I've already lost track of like my production. I'm pretty sure for the Soviets. I think I've spent 20 with these two. Another 12 over here. Plus a few extra units. I was uh, 40, right? 20, 30. We're basically at 40, and then the the last 10 or so, I think I spent it on just pure infantry, right? I also spent it on yeah to the cavalry units. So yeah, I did spend. What I'm trying to say is I did spend. I spent 20 on reinforcements, or 10 on reinforcements, 20 on HQs, the other 20 on other other reinforcing infantry. So I could try to keep my Stavka at level two. Maybe do that instead. Certainly one option. I may have to keep my staff guy level 2. I mean, right now our total HQs should be at about 10. And what I have instead is 6, 7. I only have 7. So yeah, the, the staff guy is definitely short on HQs right now, which, it, which is a problem. It's hard to mount offensive operations if we don't actually have the HQs to, to do that. Um, but it's either that or wait a whole month. And give the Germans a little extra time to prepare their defenses. Right now, I don't think it's in my best interest to keep the Germans waiting. I think we want to attack as soon as possible to keep them off guard and keep keep those uh, German HQs as busy as possible. Um, so yeah, we're gonna see how how these operations go. Uh, the Soviets are definitely definitely operating on a shoestring, and um, I can feel it. I definitely feel the. Uh, the shortage of manpower for sure. So yeah, that's a weird setup. Pretty weird setup, pretty unfortunate setup if you ask me. I'm trying to build up as many Soviet units as I can. And unfortunately we just don't have enough. That seems to be the main problem right now. We just don't have enough. Don't have enough production, don't have enough uh, anything really. I think, I think we could use some Lend-Lease right now for the winter campaign come to think of it I think it may give the Soviets just an extra little bump of manpower that they need to actually move up some units um, and I definitely hmm, I may even want to keep the Stavka um, yeah you know what I'm gonna I think I'm gonna cancel our attacks for December which is probably gonna be a move I regret doing later on but uh, we're gonna, yeah, I think we're gonna cancel the uh, Soviet moves. Give them another turn. No, F that. We're gonna attack. I want to attack. I don't wanna wait any longer. Okay, so that's that. Soviet production is done. Western Allied production has definitely gone through some notable changes as well. So the British, first of all, right off the bat, their production is gonna increase from seven that they've been having on the Western front to 17. That's the 10 boost that they got. Um, but we also have some extra production arriving from last turn. Uh, I don't think we're gonna do anything to change the, the uh, production. We're not gonna transfer any production to other theaters. And if I haven't mentioned that this already in the, in the game, but you know, as far as the production rules are concerned, you know, every single front has its own unique production. And all you really have to worry about is whether or not you're gonna save your production on that turn. But I guess technically before you do that, you can also do uh, production transfers and allocations. They're both two different things. Allocations are basically more permanent. They're the most efficient options, but I guess due to geopolitical reasons, they're usually constrained, uh, usually on a seasonal basis. So for example, you know, even if I wanted to transfer all the German production to the Eastern Front, I'm only allowed to transfer 10 per, per year. So, um, except for the first year where I can transfer like 45 or I think it's 40 production points to the, to the Eastern front, but you know, all these rules, there's a, there's a, there's a, it's a good read. I'm not going to say it's a cakewalk read, but, um, you know, if we go up here to the uh, productions, uh, 
portion of the rule book, right? There's a whole section that talks about it. Uh, talks about um, the difference between allocations and production. I'm not going to go too much, spend too much time in this video. I really recommend that you just read it yourself. Give it one good long read. Hopefully, you're you have an easier time understanding it than I do. Um, I'm pretty sure I have ADHD or something. I just find myself. It took me a very long time to actually understand this rule book. It took me like a good year, more than a year. I think two years before I finally really felt comfortable with this with this rule book. Um, I was very slow into getting getting into it, but I finally got into it. It eventually um, grew on me. Um, but the main thing you, you're thinking about when you're doing um, the production allocations is these things called season breaks, right? They happen every season um, for the uh, allies in the in, for the Mediterranean front. Um, it basically can happen every like winter or summer, but for the Eastern front, it's just every summer. Um, then there's also the transferring of production, which is different than allocation because what you're doing for transferring is you're kind of doing like this one time delivery of one front's uh, production immediately to another front. And so it's almost like an emergency uh, uh, process of sending reinforcements. The problem with this is that your production usually only arrives at half the strength. So you can send you can send one 10 production uh, point transfer from one front to another. Like in the case of the Allies, I could send 10 British production points, transfer them to the Soviets. But first of all, they're gonna half of them are gonna be lost in transit. Number one, number two, they don't arrive until the following month. So there is a delay, and you can literally think of it as just trying to assemble some sort of supplies, materials, you name it, and trying to move it from one place to another. And likewise, you got a similar relationship between the Eastern Front and the Western Front of the Third Reich. And you got the same relationship going on between, say, Western Front and Mediterranean Front. Um, for the North Northern Front, which is the last remaining front, you don't really have to worry about that because the Western half of the Northern Front uses the Western Front production. Eastern Front or the eastern half of the of the uh, northern front uses uh, eastern front production, and hopefully you saw me do that earlier when I attacked Mordmansk on the previous video. But I just want to make sure that you know this is still a tutorial video, and so I'm trying to explain a little bit of rules as we go along. But um, I I may, I am going into the game presuming that that um, my my audience has at least spent a little bit of time reading through the PDFs. It's just spending a little time to read it, you know, um, and hopefully I'm just kind of refreshing your memory or maybe clarifying some concepts or maybe showing you the concepts so that you have an easier time, you know, visually learning that concept rather than just reading it on a, on a, on a text. I think it's easier to see it than to talk about it. So with that said, hopefully I got that out of the way, but this is very relevant for this turn because I'm actually going to start doing like some British uh, transfer production points to the Soviet Union because I want the Soviets to have that I try to maximize their offensive potential for the winter campaign and that's going to be done best even if we're losing production on the Western Front right now it's pretty inactive anyways so I think it's going to be worth it so anyways you do that we've also been doing like um, the uh, shipping losses and the uh, we didn't have to worry about any kind of maintenance yet in the Mediterranean Front unless we send a non-North African unit without those special little icons that are there on the, on the bottom corner. All the units in North Africa are either resident or veteran, so they're not affected by the, uh, by the uh, desert maintenance, but we have been rolling dice for the production of shipping losses, right? And then of course we can, once you're done with, with any uh, allocation or transfers, you can then decide, do you wanna save all your production or do you want to then um, spend it and you have to pick one of the two and then you spend all or save and then and then from there on we're building new units replacing units um, building up our HQs etc so anyways back to the British the British have on this turn 17 production on the Western Front but they also have seven that were transferred over from the last turn so this turn we actually have 24 production points for the British and uh, the way I'm going to spend that 24 I'm going to go ahead and build up this HQ, um, spend one there. Um, I'm going to spend four on just an Axis unit. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Um, maybe I could save it for another turn. Uh, 
maybe try to build up some of these um, you know mech units it's fine um, then what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I don't know maybe I want to build one of these units I'm not sure you know what I'm gonna scratch that I'm not gonna build up this HQ instead I'm actually gonna build up and not this infantry I'm gonna for 14 I'm gonna be spending eight on this armor and then I'll spend eight on yeah on this desert uh, mech unit which is gonna cost six production points so that's 14 but then I have 10 left of the remaining 24 this is gonna be a production transfer that I'm gonna do if I can find the marker out there but we're gonna do a, a production transfer from the yeah here it is allied uh, transfer from the Western Front and we're gonna send it to the Eastern Front so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna put this icon in January we're in December now this should be in December we're gonna move it to January so that in January we know the Soviets are gonna gain some of that we're gonna gain five production points from that transfer you know because it's reduced in half so anyways boom there's that um, we also have 24 in the Mediterranean front. I mean, that production was just simply too good. Simply, uh, was it really 24 or was it 14? I think it was 24. And I, did, I didn't want to waste it, quite frankly. Um, yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to do another ally transfer. I think I'm allowed to do this. I think I can do a transfer from the... Mediterranean front and transfer it over to the eastern front. I think I can do that. I'm pretty sure we can double check. Maybe it's one transfer per turn, something like that. So yeah. Here it says Mediterranean front production transfers to the Soviets can be made via Persia if Tehran has rail sea supply to both London and Siberia. And they're subject to shipping losses even if that side has allied supremacy. And they're gonna be subject to shipping losses if the Axis control Narvik. Oh boy, so actually, not only are they gonna be reduced in half, but I actually have to do a dice roll to see how much production even arrives because the Axis do control Narvik all the way here in the north. So they're cutting off that supply route, basically. That's what I'm understanding. Arctic convoy is subject to losses of the access control in Narvik. And then the other, they were talking about uh, Persia. Right, we're just over here. And we're talking about Tehran right there. I think that's the capital of Persia. And so basically, yeah. So yeah, we're, we are going to do those two transfers. I'm not seeing any rule here that's saying that we can't. It just seems like we're going to get really penalized for sending units across. So yeah, that way. The, uh, the British have 20, uh, 25 production for the Mediterranean front. We'll do the dice roll. We gained a lot of production still. That's 10 plus another nine. That's 19. We just transferred over 10 from, from uh, we had, so 19 plus 24. That's an insane amount of production. Let me tell you, that's a, uh, 19 plus 24 man that is i think 43 for the allies and we don't have enough we don't have enough units to build up this this mediterranean front production i feel like we're wasting production uh we're gonna spend it on uh we did one transfer so that's 10. spend on these two hqs that's another what is that another 20. we have 13 left that i'm basically gonna throw down the drain because i just don't really have a need for those units elsewhere um which is insane so i I guess it's an indicator to me that we really got to get a move on with our British units. Do something at some point. Um, I guess what I could what I could still do technically is I could reduce the uh, the production in the Mediterranean by five. I don't want to do that though. I kind of want to keep our production strong because I know that after these battles, once our British units are under strength, it's going to take a while for us to build them up again. So that's why I want to keep it at twenty five. So yeah, anyways, that's the uh, British turns, it looks like. Soviets are gonna get, hopefully, some good production next turn. 
switch to the axis production now. And the axis production is only going to go up by five. Um, so on the western front, we're going up from now 22 to 27. And I could transfer some over to the Mediterranean front, but I don't think there's a real need. You know, there really isn't a real need. Nah, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not worried about it right now. Sure, some of our units are under strength, but it's no problem. I think, did we transfer any production over? I think we already spent them on the last turn. Did I even do British or, or uh, did I even do Axis production on the last turn? No, I don't even remember at this point. I've, I've lost track. I've got, I got disorganized. Fortunately, with my units here, I think I did build up these units. I'm gonna presume that they did. I mean, I, I probably, I probably made a mistake there, folks. But you know, at this point, it ain't, it ain't too big of a deal. Um, we're gonna just presume that the dice rolls were bad. Problem solved. Uh, anyways, I'm gonna roll four dice. This time we get only nine production. So we don't even have one HQ that we can build up. Oh my gosh. Um, but I'm pretty sure, I, I'm trying to remember if I had any production on the last turn for the, for the uh, Germans and the Italians. I want to say I forego, I, for, I for, forwent their production. Cause I saw this, this MF-18 here. And I think I was going to spend it on maybe some ground units. But I decided to forego that. Yeah. So I'm. Mean, you know what? I'm going to include it. The 18 with the nine that we just rolled. It's 27. And with that 27, we'll go ahead and just build up these units. Like so. Boom. Yeah. So axes are at full strength in North Africa as well. So that's that. All right. That should be the last time we make any mistake like that. I think for the rest of the game. In fact, I'm gonna change these labels, mark them as zero, just so that I don't make that mistake again. Mark them as zero. Boom. And that is how you do, don't get confused with your production. Um, but I'm sure it happens with, with players from time to time. Um, but you know, that's this is probably one of those cases where I can really make the uh make the point of trying to like program this game and have all the rules built in so we don't have to worry about that right we can still enjoy the game um but i mean some people some people they say they like to, to, to memorize the rules I, I would definitely say that it definitely challenged my intellect but you know i um i have come to learn more about the game more about the war to some degree um we'll do the western front production right now which is at 27 pretty juicy Western Front production. I think we also got some reinforcements here in December. Yes, we have another militia unit, which I will happily accept, as well as an armored core. We're going to put the armored core in Paris for sure. And then as far as these other units, um, not sure where to put them. I feel like I don't really need to put them too much anywhere. Maybe I do. I probably do. I just don't want to underestimate where to put him. Um, I'm going to leave this 15th unit just there as a reserve for now. I don't really need it. Um, but we are going to play this armored unit. So we have 17 production left. Um, that's an, just enough to build um, just a bunch of infantry. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus on the infantry. Try to build up all my infantry up as soon as possible. And then the idea being that I can start deploying my infantry across to other sectors and, and so on. And that way I, um, I'm able to basically transfer reinforcements to the, uh, transfer over reinforcements to the Eastern front sooner rather than later. I got a few German four strength core, at least three that I see that I could transfer over. Maybe I can even transfer over this armored core if I want. But the idea is we have all the ports. Oh man, all but one. 
that we have not secured. So let's probably, let's go and secure that. And then start transferring units to the Eastern Front if we can. That's the overall strategy. Now, as far as Eastern Front production, you know, it has not improved. Um, it is still at 69 right now. Um, but what has changed for the month of December is the uh, penalties for the German Eastern Front. And I'm actually going to just put the icon on the map. Yeah, I'm going to put the uh, penalties here. It's kind of hard to read. That icon is a little blurry. But there's a number of things that happen. Three, three penalties. Uh, first of all, snow does reduce the movement of units. We know that much. But it's going to make it so that all the ground units, including the Panzer Corps, can only move one hex at a time for the winter. So basically, the antifreeze and the German tanks even froze. The Panzers cannot move any faster than the infantry can. So that's a big problem for the Panzer Corps, number one. Number two, their offensive fire of all the German units will become single fire. So no more double double fire advantages attacking, except with air power. Uh, speaking of which, the air power on the Eastern Front has now changed to uh, double fire for the Germans. And you can check that out when you look at the table here. And here is the Eurofront air firepower table. Uh, we look around, look around, look for Winter 41. You can see that it says DF for the Axis instead of TF as it said in S41, which is Summer 41. W41 is Winter. Um, so yeah, basically that's another icon that I can put up here. And uh, yeah, I think that would be just helpful. Try to use more of these icons since we are making a tutorial. Yeah, let's try to make it feel more tutorial-y. I know that I, I kind of... Uh, get so absorbed in this game that I forget that you know my audience may not actually fully know how to play the game and I feel like it's not the same when the audience doesn't know how to play so I'm gonna put those two markers there that's where they normally are um, and then I guess I can put some markers of the same kind on the Western fronts if I want uh, they should be a double fire by now I think yeah, they're double fire everywhere. Allies are fully double fire. And that's the thing about the allies. They have only, they only need one, one icon, really. The Germans need two because the those values do change in other theaters. Eastern Front and Western Front are not the same. And then we got the Soviet icon as well, which is just one icon. And it actually looks... Like from here on out, the whatever happens on the Western Front for the Axis is the same fate for the, their uh, air, air firepower as it is for the uh, you know Western Front, Mediterranean Front. They're all the same. That's what I'm trying to say. And um, yeah. So anyways, let's find that other marker. Yeah, this is going to be double fire. Okay. That's that. So yeah, I did. I haven't mentioned the last effect is that the HQ production goes up to 15 production points, and that's what we're really focusing on now. So the HQs are more expensive for the Germans. Um, so every time they spend an HQ, is going to cost them that much more. So I'm trying to avoid using really any HQs if I can, and try to focus all my production on ground units if I can. So I'm going to spend 15 there, OKH. All the other German HQs, I'm going to try to ignore them for all I care probably not a good idea but I'm gonna just try to build up my ground units um, we're gonna build up this uh, these units that's 14 we have 50 I did 69 minus minus 15 is 54 now we just spent 14 so now we're at 40 and so with 40 we can spend it on 10 infantry cadre or 10 infantry divisions really so let's do that we got one, two, three, four, five. Yep, that's it. And then six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's forty. That's that's how forty production points looks like on the eastern front. Just building up a frick ton of infantry. I'm gonna reduce this one at Kiev and strengthen these guys over here actually 
yeah but the overall the overall idea is to have as many strong german infantry as i can that's going to be like my fundamental strategy right now because i just want to make sure i have as many strong infantry as i can so that wherever the soviets decide to attack we can plug the gap that's the idea i don't have much in the form of a reserve so the sooner i can transfer over these units to the western front the better from the from the western front to the eastern front the better but i only have one that's really ready right now to actually move over this guy in um where was he at here in, in amsterdam you know i think he, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I could actually send him across to the Eastern Front, but he's only at level two. Kind of want to wait for the Western Front production to build up these units a bit more before I start transferring, transferring them over to the Eastern Front. But we are going to need, we're definitely going to need more uh, German troops on the Eastern Front, if at all possible. You know, I could also move up this Romanian unit as well. But that's it. That's it for the Germans. Um, you know, I don't have, I'm not going to spend too much on HQs. I hope that's, that's the right move because the, my, my, the idea here is that we don't spend anything on HQs, but I probably should have at least one level two HQ over here. So as, as much as I want to just stack up on infantry, you know, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to just stick to this. You know, we, we have enough mobility, I hope. Okay. So that's going to sum up the German production. Come to think of it, I probably should have started the production with the Soviets or with the uh, the Germans first, given that it's the Soviets who have the strategic initiative right now. But that's fine. No problem. But now we can actually do the Soviet turn. And so let's look at how it starts. Uh, I'm going to end the log file. We're going to start a new one. This one is going to be 12. This time it's going to be the actual 12. And... Um, yeah, I decided that I want to attack. So we're going to make an attack with this Ukrainian HQ. We're going to launch a light, a relatively light attack against the Germans. Uh, yeah, I was really hoping that we could do a better attack than this, but truth, truth be told, this is probably as good as it's going to get as far as, as far as Russian attacks. Uh, and I think that the situation for the Germans is bad, but the situation for the Soviets is equally bad, if not technically worse, given that they just don't have enough units. It's, it's really, it's really unfortunate. But yeah, this is going to be the main attack. If the Germans decide to launch a counterattack, you know, uh, ouch, ouchy daisies. I almost want to, I almost kind of want to hold off this Soviet attack, maybe give it another turn before I do uh, but no we're, we're gonna go ahead and launch something I don't want to wait too long we'll see if this attack is any good we will see I'm gonna put an airstrike there and that's it that's the only move I have planned for the Soviets right now is this one attack to the north or rather east of Odisha uh, supported by this Ukrainian HQ I don't know why this Ukrainian HQ right now is fighting in the north but should probably be fighting in the Ukraine right um, but it just goes to show you the situation for the Soviets is pretty abysmal as far as all their units and just the way they're spread out. Definitely cumbersome. But we're going to make do with what we have here. Um, we're going to start this attack. And that's it. I don't want to activate Stavka. It's only level 2. Um, unless I, I, I was originally going to wait. Um... I may try to activate stuff. I could do activate it on the next turn. So we'll, we'll just wait on the next turn if I still decide when to activate the stuff. But that's it. That's it for the uh, Soviets. Let's start the battle over here. And we're facing a very strong defense. We'll start the airstrike. It does score a hit. Nice. So it's uh, rather the Germans have double fire defense. They score only one hit. We get to roll six dice, single fire. We score another hit. Not nice. Nicely done. So it goes to show the Soviets got a little bit of firepower themselves. All right, not a bad, not a bad start. I have to say, not a bad start to the uh, to the attack. So I'll give the uh, Soviets some credit there. They actually did a pretty decent attack. 
cool. So that's all we got for the Soviets. Not much eventful in any other way. The British can finally make their move. The British are being wanting to be extra slow this time around. But uh, we're gonna make an attack with our primary HQ, the 21st. We're gonna make an attack over here. And I don't know, maybe I should attack with a mech unit. We will. And then we're just gonna try to uh, stack up all our other units. Yeah, I gotta be real careful with whatever the Germans have on that flank. So no, we're gonna attack with the Australians. And then we're gonna try to just assemble some sort of defense. So that the Germans right now, the Germans could only send two units to uh, to Derna, but it may be strong enough still to do some some sort of damage. So that's what we're gonna do with the British. I think I've also decided I'm gonna bring up a British reinforcement, this 13th Mech Corps, um, but it's really far away. So it's gonna take a while before it actually gets to Egypt. I'm actually gonna have to send it, here it is on this map. I'm gonna have to send it all the way around the African continent. So this is gonna be the first rule that involves a uh, supreme naval move, or, or they call them sea moves. But they have a limited distance, but for every single basin that you move this unit across, it's going to uh, cost you one supreme move. So that means from the English Channel to the Atlantic Ocean, it's going to cost me two supreme moves to get that unit all the way down here to South Africa. Then it's going to take me another two to move it from South Africa into the Indian Ocean and then through into the Red Sea, eventually get it to Egypt. So um, I cannot do four supreme moves unfortunately with this hq i can't blitz with it or anything like that so one two thankfully the atlantic basin is humongous and so i can just send it this is why they have this kind of side map over here but you know you can imagine just coming around here arriving in south africa now technically the south africa the southern zone is part of the mediterranean theater so this unit here um, it's gonna be it's gonna have to go through um, something called acclimatization which is a rule that basically uh, weakens a unit as soon as it arrives to one of the either the northern front or Mediterranean front and you gotta have to go into the rule book read about each uh, front but there is a whole section in the rule book that talks about the fronts they're talking about the west front the east front here's the med front and we're just looking for the acclimatization rules um, the front can get activated we don't have to worry about that since it was already activated at the start of 1941 but if I ever start a 1939 campaign I can do that but here it is it says acclimatization all units entering the meta front from another front immediately lose to combat value so this full strength core just for entering the Mediterranean front is reduced by two what a shame but that's just what the developers did. It's probably some sort of reflection and loss of material or logistics. Maybe, I'm not sure what the rule is. It says accl acclimatization. Maybe it's just the cost of supplies, something like that. Anyways, this unit is gonna be a little weaker than we had hoped, but it's on its way to, to, uh, to Egypt. And then I can also move another unit. I can move actually two more uh, British units. And I gotta figure out what my plan of action is. I don't know if I want to do an operation in, um, in say, like southern France, right? Um, or if I want to attack Norway, right? These are these are this is sort of the strategy that I need to try to devise as soon as possible, really. I also have, yeah, that that H that beachhead. So yeah, um, unfortunately Portsmouth seems to be full. So I want to, I'm gonna move these two units as in unison. Right, I wanna move these as a couple. But I just wanna make sure I can put them somewhere where they actually have space. 
I'm gonna put him here in Dover, I think. But yeah, that's gonna be my four supreme moves. Not too eventful, but it's something. I think actually the smarter move would be to get this armored unit like out of the way. And then of course we have to decide if we want to make a uh, move against, uh, you know, something like uh, Brest. In which case I would probably want this HQ to be in Portsmouth and be in, in command range at least. And we control the naval the English Channel. We're gonna have some actual air support, which is something I really do want to see. Unfortunately, we wouldn't have any um, HQ support. So yeah, you know what? I'm gonna move. I'm actually gonna move this unit to Portsmouth. This unit can stay up there for now. Then I'm gonna to try to move one more unit to a better position than that. So yeah, I'm just trying to just trying to just trying to experiment with these different uh you know yeah operational things that we have available. Try to figure out a better, a better combination if we can. So I think I'm going to stick with that for now. I'm still experimenting with the British. So anyways, that's that for the British. And you know, I actually realized that I do the that I do the access moves already. I did not. I did the sequence wrong. Or, um, technically, you want to do the British after the access. Because um, the Axis still have initiative on the Western Front. My bad. Thankfully, these moves are pretty negligible. So, um, before I go on to the Mediterranean Front, I probably should have done the German turn instead. The Germans definitely want to reinforce this sector over there. So, what we're going to do with the Germans is we're going to... Go ahead and activate OKH. Try to move up as many reinforcements as we can. So, for example, the third Romanian army. I'm not sure where I want to put it. Some of our rudimentary is fine. I may even just send it up to uh, Kiev. transfer a German core over there to Orsha. So that's two strategic moves. Third strategic move I can do is move this unit from the Western Front. It's going to cost me two strategic moves to move it. But I think it'll be worth it. So, you know, one, two, three, four, five. I think that may be the limit to the amount of moves they can make. I, mean, I gotta double check on that. But we wanna look at strategic moves, which are basically these rail moves. Yeah, here we go, rail movement. But I wanna know about rail movement across different fronts. Talks about rail disengagement, lines of communication. Map edge rail routes. Yeah, they can't be combined. Um, a rail moves must begin to rest and end in friendly rail hex. Yep. Oh, and then it says C6.72 for rail moves that cross boundaries. Let's look for that. 6.62. Supreme moves can be used to make strategic rail moves, right? Um, but what about moves across those freaking 
which I'm gonna call it front. Um, and a supreme move and da 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 command supreme line moves can move against blitz. No, we got that. Can enter enemy territory by strategic move. They can disengage strategically. Oh, here it is. Changing fronts. 6.72. That's what it was. It says um, that it basically we can we can command rail, rail or sea moves that begin on their fronts and continue into another front. But in such cases, each rail move segment beginning outside the command front is limited to five hexes. I see. And here's an example. A unit in Leipzig is commanded to move uh, by rail to Königsberg. It crosses into the eastern front after four hexes of its 10 row hex move. Um, it says the unit can move another six hexes in the eastern front. Um, any further rail moves beginning in the eastern front can only be five rail hexes each. Oh, that's interesting. But uh, it says, but such cases, each rail move segment beginning outside the command front is limited to five hexes. Okay, so here's an example. It says a unit in Leipzig is commanded to move by rail to Königsberg. Where is Leipzig? We can try to, oh, there it is. Okay. And so it's saying uh, it crosses into the eastern front after four hexes of its tail rail hex move. Since that rail move began in the western front, the unit can move another six hexes in the eastern front. But then it says any further rail moves beginning in the eastern front can only be five rail hexes each. So I guess that's because of a gauge change. So I think we can move ten this time. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nice. So yeah, I think I think that's fair game. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I think it still works either way. So, anyways, we've done, what is that? F three supreme moves. Um, I guess I want to move up this reduced uh, armored core into that hex just to ensure the Soviets don't break through or anything, or not. Uh, but I think we're looking pretty good here in the north. Um, but I've done three strategic moves. I have three left. I'm not really sure what other moves I even want to do. I think the best choices would be to uh, pull out from these, these fortified areas. Don't think we need so many units there. I'm trying to just basically assemble some sort of strategic reserve of uh, mech core. I think that's going to be the main the main takeaway I have right now. So like I've done one, two, three, four, five, and then one more unit. For example, I can. Hmm. I, yeah, I think I think I'm going to pull out a Panzer Corps from Bryansk. There you go. Because we don't need we don't need to have such a thick defense right now all over the place. And that's going to be my moves for OKH. Voila. So now we can continue with the Axis turn. Since they had the initiative on the Western Front, technically these British moves haven't happened yet. Now that I know that the British are attacking in hindsight, you know, I'm going to uh, make it a little bit more challenging for the British. We're going to move up that unit there. Yeah, I figure we're, I figure we're going to go ahead and do that. Okay, and then we're going to assume that everything else is the same. Now the British are doing their attack. We can switch to the British turn now and continue on with the turn. And then uh, we're going to do the airstrike here. Let's see. Let's see how well the British do. They may do well. They may not. We're about to find out. Anyways, let's go ahead and do this battle here. 
Airstrike does have double fire. No hits. Defenders roll four dice. No hits. The Australians roll two hits. Nice. Although the Italians have double defense because this is hill country. But at least the attack succeeded. That's all I really care about. Made some progress. Made some headway there. Okay. So that's that. Uh, for That's going to sum up the British turn. Now we can actually move on to the next four knights. And kind of roll on over to the Soviet turn. Who have the initiative right now on the Western Front. I don't think we're going to do any moves for the Soviets uh, for this turn. We're going to pass. So the Germans have a little bit of extra time to move up some reinforcements if they so desire. Um, but they're going to have to expand uh, their second HQ. I think we're going to hold off because I want my Stavka. I want all these other units to be stronger. Then again, if I were to activate Stavka now, I can actually start setting up an attack here in the north on the next turn. And, and that's, that's, I think, what I want to do. I want to be able to put as much pressure on the Soviets, or on the Germans, rather, as soon as I can. That's like... I'd probably say that's the main thing. So I'm going to do two moves, two strategic moves there. Now we'll put it over here. Two strategic moves. Um, maybe I want to consider sending more units to, uh, yeah, that's fine. So yeah, that's two strategic moves. A third strategic move might be to move the 14th core up to, uh, Soroka. That's one option. I think a better one would be to move this, uh, 11th army over here. That's another one. And then I have one more left. And I would argue that probably the best one, the best one that I see right now, is to actually pull out this uh, 10th core, this armored core. We're going to try to use this armored core as a breakout unit. So I think it's best if we get it pulled out of Elikiluki and start setting up a good attack. If I were the Germans, I would probably pull out right now if I were them, but they're going to have to spend more money. So that's the downside. So that's it for the Soviets. We won't do any actual attack. We won't even do a second round of combat over here. Although I guess I could have probably provided it with some air support. Did I want to attack with air support? Hmm. I could, I most certainly could, could have. I also, I also could have given it combat support, but I figured since we didn't have the reinforcements there, it's better if we wait. That way we can attack with just a better concentration of troops. That's the idea. Um, hopefully that's the right call. It may not be. So hold on, I did two strategic moves there. And then I did another two over here. Man, I kind of wish I had one more. I would have pulled out, I think, another mech, or another armored unit, or excuse me, infantry unit. And I would have had more Soviet core available to attack. But I think we'll do that on the next turn. So yeah, that's it for the Soviets. Um, somewhat uneventful turn. We'll switch over now to the Germans. And they can do their turn. The Germans have to decide here and now do they want to reinforce the uh, the foothold they have right now east of Orsha, or do they just want to defend what they have? Chances are the Soviets are going to pour in more troops. So, you know, we might be outnumbered two to one. Very, we might find ourselves very quickly outnumbered. And then, of course, it's going to make our flank that much more vulnerable. Um, so I could, I could pull out, or I could reinforce. Either way, I'm going to have to activate OKH, which is a bit of a kind of a cost if you ask me I'd rather keep my OKH at full strength if at all possible so I'm going to do that instead I'm going to focus on, on the OKH and I think I'm just going to accept the fact that these armored core are going to probably have to fight to the death and hopefully they can meet, uh, sustain a better defense than what they did last time um, the only other problem I see with that though is that it's going to 
Uh, it's going to dislodge our entire front, our entire flank of the front. If we lose these two core, we don't have much in the way of reinforcements, right? We have a few more, I think, uh, that we can move up from other sectors. But I just realized that I forgot to uh, do um, OKW and actually start bringing up these reinforcements. So the German reinforcements are on their way, but they're going to take a little longer, I think. So uh, I think we're just going to have to make do with what we have. Um, so that's it for the German turn. Now I'm going to switch over to the British, who get to have the last say in this month. And uh, we've got some units that are in better position. I just realized I could have moved that unit over there. Dang nabbit. We could have done a amphibious invasion on the next turn. Um, I didn't. I didn't plan very well, but oh well. Lesson learned. Um, the British over here, though, I kind of want to do another round of attack if I can, and try to just deal with this Libyan pocket, especially the, if the Germans aren't going to do anything. Uh, I don't plan to do anything with the Germans on this turn. Just keep delaying the British. Um, but we're going to have to launch another attack in order to actually see some success. Um, so I think that's probably our best move, if I'm, if I'm being real frank. Let's try to do another attack while we have the initiative. So let's go for it. Another airstrike. I could send another British unit forward, but I'm worried that these units are not going to be strong enough to withstand a German attack on the flank. So we're going to go ahead and just attack with what we got. Start with the airstrike. It scores one half hit. Defenders score one hit. Ouch. The Anzac troops do not score a hit. So unfortunately, that attack somewhat failed. Okay, and that's going to sum it up for the uh, the, the uh, turn overall. Yeah, that's going to sum up the December turn. So overall, Soviets are making a little bit of headway. They at least were able to cross some part of the Nipper River. Uh, see if they uh, a lot of concentration of Soviet troops here in the center. So I think this is where the Soviet main offensive will take place. But we also have plans here in the north in Leningrad. Uh, the German fog of war right now, we're going to presume they don't really sus suspect too much. Perhaps they, uh, they, they're clearly aware of this Soviet drive over here, but presumably nothing at Leningrad. Other than that, um, the British have more units transferred to the south. I'm going to try to have these units um, actually try to invade somewhere over here. Um, I just realized, you know what, I'm, I am going to go ahead and do one German turn for uh, production. I, I did skip one, but I should have been able to then do another one. And so what we're going to do is, uh, yeah, move around some units. I'm going to go ahead and, for example, get uh, this mech unit. Should I go ahead and do it? Technically, I, I skipped the turn. I think I'm going to go ahead and do it. If I was playing with somebody, it would, it would definitely be slightly easier to manage because I, I wouldn't have so many units to command, right? Um, but anyway, so that's one strategic move. Another one will be here. One, two. Here is three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's three. Here's four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's four altogether. One, two, three, four. So I got two more. And I'm not really sure whether you need to move up. This guy here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or rather, Seven, eight, nine, ten. How about that? So one, two, three, four, five. So I got one more move that I would want to do. And the only other move I can think of I mean Italy looks good. Yeah, the only other move I could think of is uh 
hide these units. I'm also gonna, I am gonna activate this HQ over here and transfer this guy over. But the only other moves I can think of other than that is, uh, I don't know. These are all a bunch of rail moves. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I probably, I probably would think the best move would be. I don't know if I have to march into Lyon to uh, take the capital. I may have to if the Allies declare war. So I don't know. I guess I'll just leave it there. You know what? I think I'll put this armored core over here. How about that? Interesting move. Yeah. Seems to be somewhat of a decent move. And that's all I got for OKW. And now I'm done with the German turn. Presumably the British did their attack. Voila. And now I think we can end the turn. So yeah, I got to get better with the uh, sequences, especially now that the initiatives are changing. But the idea remains the same. Soviets have the initiative on the Western Front, or on the Eastern Front, rather. Axis have the initiative on the Western and Mediterranean and Northern Fronts. And then the only other thing I really have to worry about is just uh, calculating weather. You know, the, the sea storms, I, I decided to not do it on these last few turns because technically uh, no amphibious operations are happening, but it's good to always know the, the, the storms on each turn. And then other than that, I think we got ourselves uh, an interesting setup. I think the Soviets are definitely going to be, we're, gonna, we're, we're definitely going to have fun with the Soviets in this winter for sure. But um, that's all I got for this video. I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, I think the only thing I forgot to do was probably the finished production. Right? Technically, they should have nine. September. They enter the war in September. October, November, December. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I got to keep track of the, the, uh, the finished production. Right now, the production is going to be at 12. Right? So yeah, um, but that's it. That's all I got for this turn. Thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you uh, enjoyed this video, getting getting kind of into the sort of feel of World War II. Right now we're in 1941. The Axis definitely have a lot of advantages everywhere, but the, you know the Allies are trying to push back, but chances are they're not going to make any real headway until either 1942 or 1943. And of course, the Axis, you know, the German army still has a lot of fight within it. So despite the uh, poor conditions for the Axis, it's going to be hard to still make some headway. So that's all I got for this video. Stay tuned for more Soviet defensives, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.